Okay, I would like to continue our discussion of uh, the word indignation. I talked yesterday about the religious leaders of Jerusalem becoming indignant. I'll just read it to you again. <clears throat> Matthew twenty-one fifteen. When the religious leadership of Jerusalem saw the boys and girls and the young people crying out, Hosanna, they were indignant. They were indignant toward Jesus. And they were indignant toward the young people having the unmitigated gall to express love and adoration to this charlatan. <clears throat> you know, indignation works both ways. That's the title of this. Yet, I don't know why. I, I can't point to any specific incidents where I was told this specifically, but I just, ever since I was old enough to, to think, it seems, as far back as I can remember, somehow or other I was conditioned to believe that I did not have a right to be indignant toward those who did evil to me and the people that I loved. But I do know this, it got worse, that, that pressure, that sense, that feeling that I, it's wrong. It is wrong for me to be upset at wrongdoing from others. Now, not myself. I grew up in a house of complete indignance. I mean, I, I mean that, that was how I was raised with, by two individuals who knew, had nothing but indig, indignation toward me. 24-7. I've got a feeling many of you watching this know what I'm talking about. If you were raised by wolves. Indignation. It, it means angry contempt. Angry scorn. Uh, looking down upon you as a lesser, as a weaker, an attitude of, you're just a child, I'm the adult, or you're, you're stupid, I'm the smart one here. That kind of attitude mixed with anger. It produces shame. Indignation from the wicked. <clears throat> Indignation that emanates from the malignant narcissist is designed, it's a tactic designed to inflict the target with with shame con with condemnation that's what these religious leaders were doing or attempting to do to yeshua and these young people and the parents of these young people when they were crying out hosanna Hosanna as Yeshua walked through the streets of Jerusalem. 
They're trying to shame them. They're trying to condemn them. They're indignant. It's it's an affront to my dignity to have to stoop so low to correct you and show you once again where you are wrong and how you are wrong. You, You get the sense of what I'm talking about. Indignant. Oh, I know what it is. <laughs> I know you do too. Well, it's funny how it, it it doesn't work both ways, it seems. Seems like the abuser ha- almost has a right to act that way toward the the oppressed seems like the oppressor gets a free ticket to be indignant, whereas the oppressed, oh, don't be angry. And definitely don't be indignant. We, we, no, we, 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 we're above that. We forgive and we don't judge. This is an indignation-free zone, this church is. This family is, this society is, this organization is. Yet in church, it it seems as if the burden to change was never on the, the wicked man. He was allowed to express himself in an indignant form toward his spouse or his children or whoever else he targeted. He's hurting. He hates himself. You need to show, not indignation. You must have mercy on him. And if you don't, the big guy, the man upstairs, he won't forgive you. Boy, how, how do you like having that hanging over your head? If I don't forgive this guy for torturing me, God won't forgive me? Talk about a burden. And talk about a sick doctrine. I guess what I'm trying to say is I never felt like I had the right, the moral right, to have indignation toward the wicked. Church definitely left me with that sense. Well, I want to know what the Bible says. What does the Bible say about not only wicked indignation, but righteous indignation, (coughs) godly indignation? Did you know there is a righteous indignation of evil? Did you know it's okay to be indignant towards evil? and evil people. You have a right to your righteous, that's what the word righteous means, right? You have a moral right to be angry. And any more in these days we live in, and you look around and see the rank open wickedness just out in open display and you and a person who doesn't have even a little bit of anger about what's going on now in society you are in denial 
And it's going to cost you mentally. We live in perilous times. And to deny that is folly. For someone, especially uh, especially someone who purports to have faith, for someone not to be vexed and angry at what's going on in society today, particularly involving our children, there's something wrong. Let me give you an example of righteous indignation. The indignation that you and I have a moral right to possess. It's in Mark chapter 10. Very familiar portion of scripture. I I, I bet everyone, Christian or non-Christian, has heard this story. So it's what I would call what I, a Sunday school story. One you just kind of read and say, that's cute, and move on. Mark 10. Start at verse 1. And I'm going to move down to, I think it's around verse 12 or 13. Now Jesus left Capernaum. That was his hometown. Jesus left his hometown and he went to the region east of the Jordan. And crowds of people gathered around him. Multitudes of people surrounded him. And these people kept bringing young children to him that he might touch them. That's what the scripture says. They brought kids up to him that he might touch them. I looked up the word touch in Strong's, and it means to cling to and hug. They brought their children up to Yeshua so he could hug them, to hold them tight to him. That's what he was doing. He wasn't just formally laying his hands on their forehead in a dignified way. He was... (laughs) He he was bear-hugging these kids. That's Jesus. They kept bringing the young children to Jesus that he might hug them. And the disciples, these were his own staff now, his disciples were reproving those parents for bringing their kids up to him. They're trying to get them to stop. This is undignified. But when Jesus saw what was happening, when Jesus saw his own disciples trying to stop these parents from bringing their kids up to him, he was indignant. That doesn't mean just a little bit angry. The word wrath comes to mind. He was indignant. Our example. I did hear this in church. I heard this ad nauseum in church. Jesus is my example. Did you ever hear that? Jesus is our example. I remember, I don't know if they still have them or not, but they used to sell these bracelets you could wear. WWJD, what would Jesus do? What would Jesus do? Yeah, those rubber bracelets. But I was never told uh, 
that I could be indignant, <laughs> be indignant like Jesus. What? Temple. Yes, he was. Changers. Yeah, the money. Very indignant there. Woo. Yeah, you saw a little indignance there. Tony uh, uh, mentioned the the time he turned over the tables in the temple and whooped some, and whooped some behind. He did. I mean, he. You can read it. No one ever talks well, about that either. He 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 was whipping people. <laughs> can you imagine? Adults, can you imagine these adults being spanked by Yeshua? <laughs> yeah, he was indignant that day. And God was with him. He was indignant on this day when when his own disciples are trying to stop the kids from coming up to him so he could hug them and bless them. He was upset. I'll bet you he wanted to spank his disciples with a cat of nine tails. I've never seen, now that we're on the topic, I can't recall one instance in Scripture where anyone ever talked back when Jesus was mad. Not even the Pharisees. Just something about the Messiah's anger. It. Ugh. Ugh. So these parents and guardians in the crowd kept bringing the young ones up to Yeshua, the little ones up to Yeshua, that he might give them a big bear hug and bless them. And the disciples were a little bit indignant about that. We have a reputation to uphold. This is a this isn't the this isn't children's church. This isn't Sunday school. We're eating at the big boy table. <laughs> well, Jesus saw what was going on and he was indignant and I I can assure you his indignation is a whole lot bigger than yours. And he said to them, and I'm sure he said this to them with fury in his voice, you allow the children to come to me. And I'm going to paraphrase this a little bit. You aren't catching on, are you? You're not getting it. He's talking to his disciples. You're not getting it. For of such, it's the, it's the, it's the ones like these children that belong to me. These are mine. You, quote, adults out there with your degrees and education and wisdom, <clears throat> you who think you are wise, you who think you are grown up spiritually. You're, the, my kingdom has no place for you. It's these little ones. It's the children. It's the meek. It's the humble. It's the poor. 
poor in spirit, like children. It's the powerless. It's the ones to whom human honor and human privilege has never existed, does not exist, and probably will never exist. It's the ones despised by the adults. It's the ones who it's better to be seen than not heard crowd. It's the least. These are the ones who belong to me. You let them come up here. You allow these children. He's okay. Having cat issues again. That's why I got a new microphone, by the way. They chewed through the cord. Oh, and I might add, they seem to know when I'm recording, too. They, <laughs> I don't know what it is. They go crazy. You allow these little ones to come to me. They're mine. Okay, I'm going back to the scripture. When Jesus saw it, he was indignant and said to them, Allow them to come to me. Truly, I tell you. Now get this. Whoever does not receive, accept, and welcome the kingdom of God like a little child positively shall not enter it at all. He's telling his disciples this. That if you don't become like these little children, you won't have any part of me at all. Of such is my kingdom. So this is one example where it's okay to be a little bit indignant taking Yeshua as our example. I could put it this way. It's okay to be a little bit indignant when you see someone telling one of God's little ones that they don't have a right to their anger at the wrongdoing and evil done to them. Evil and wrongdoing done to them to repress the truth from entering their heart. That's what shame does. That's what shame and condemnation is designed to do. Is to make you feel unworthy to be in the presence and the company of God. That's what shame and that deep-seated sense of unworthiness is designed to do to you. To repress to repress the truth, the truth being you have every right to be in God's presence. He's adopted you. He's adopted you.
those who try to stop God's little ones from clinging to God or clinging to their own inner being, their own conscience, which is the connector to God. Well, you have every right to be indignant toward that type. Those who want to keep you from receiving a hug, a love hug, from the Master. They're the ones in the wrong. They, they try to shame you. Who do you think you are? Ah. <sighs> I'll be right back. I gotta take a break. Sorry, too much coffee. Too much coffee. Okay. I'm going to read a couple of more indignation scriptures that demonstrate to us we have a right to be indignant toward the wicked. Every right. Second uh, Corinthians, where to where to go? Yeah, I'll read here. Second Corinthians eleven twenty nine, and Paul here is talking about himself and the trials he ha has been through, but he makes this comment. He's talking about himself. He's saying, "I have who is made to stumble." and have his faith hurt, and I am not on fire with indignation. Basically, he's saying, when I witness someone who is being made to stumble and have his faith hurt, I, I am on fire with indignation toward the one who is causing that person to stumble in the faith on fire with indignation. I am on fire with indignation when I see the truth being repressed and hindered from God's people and His children. Like those children we read about. Okay, 2 Corinthians 7.11 
this is in reference to the church at Corinth that had to deal with wickedness in their midst. Uh, I'm sure you're familiar with it. There was incest going on in their church, and they were just letting it slide. Paul writes this in 2 Corinthians 7. Look back and observe what godly sorrow has produced in you. Godly sorrow, which is the pain of conscience that comes with the realization of missing God, caused you to clear yourselves of all complicity in the condoning of wickedness, and in this case, the wickedness of incest. Now, Paul is praising them for this. Check this out. What indignation you demonstrated. What zeal to do justice to all concerned and what readiness to mete out punishment to the offender this godly sorrow produced in you. So when the church at Corinth realized, and it came with sorrow, when they sorrowfully realized the gravity of the wickedness involved in this situation, they became indignant, and Paul praises them for it. He does not condemn them for having feelings of indignation. He praises them for it, for having indignation against this wicked person. In fact, he praised them for having a readiness to dish out punishment to the offender. This sure doesn't sound like church today. I believe it's okay to feel and experience indignation concerning the abuse and evil behavior done against you personally. I have indignation toward those who have robbed me, robbed me of dear, close relationships I could have had. Yes, I feel indignation. I have angry contempt toward these people. And did you know God backs me for it? God feels the same way I do. I have indignation toward those who have robbed me of dreams I had. And they did. I have indignation toward those who robbed me of reaching, I believe, my potential in certain talents I possess. It's hard to reach your potential when you're just trying to survive. Yeah, I have indignation, not love. And it's okay. In fact, the times I've gone to God about it in prayer, I get the sense he's even more upset than I am. In fact, I know he's even more upset about it than I am. He's indignant. Indignation goes both ways. 
the narc, the reprobate, he, he gets indignant at, at us when we cling to the truth because he wants to be your truth. He becomes indignant when we show loyalty to something other than Him because He wants to be the object of your loyalty. I'm sorry, Mr. Nark. You ain't my God. I'm sure I have family members that are indignant toward me for going no contact. How dare you? I'm sure they say. To which I reply, How dare you? For turning your back on my Savior. For turning your back on God and your conscience. I mean, forget the way you treated me. Let's, let's, let's just leave that out of the equation. Let's talk about how you have treated the holy things of God. Now, we can use my own soul and my own person as an example because anyone who treats another human being with the contempt and the vile, the vileness that you did, it's quite apparent you don't have an nth of reverence for God. To treat someone created in the image of God, whether that be me or anyone else, whether it be the cashier in a grocery store, or the waiter in a restaurant, For you to treat with that arrogant contempt anyone who's made in the image of God that way tells me you don't know him and you don't have any inclination to know him either. So how dare you, you who are without excuse, you to whom God attempted to reveal himself to your inner consciousness when you were younger. And you said, nah, I got my own plans. And the more malignant among you said, nah, I enjoy this. I like hurting people. I like being in control of people. Who ought to be indignant at who? You're indignant at me for walking away from your idolatry? <laughs> you bunch of idols, you bunch of snakes, you bunch of self-deluded people, you bunch of unholy, you who cling to your unholy, unclean doctrines of devils. And you're indignant at me. And you're indignant at God's little ones. You're indignant at the, at the ones that you tortured and enslaved. And yeah, I'm talking to you enablers too. You cowards. No, I am indignant toward those of you who have repressed, I'm talking to Mr. Narcissist, Mr. and Mrs. Malignant Narcissist, I'm talking about them. You who kept God's little ones from coming to a realization and an understanding of just how deeply they are loved and adored by their Creator. You filled them with shame. 
That's what the disciples of Jesus were doing at the time, filling those parents with shame for how dare you bring these kids up here. They were shaming the children as well. Here's a side note. <clears throat> I did a little research on this portion of Scripture that, where Jesus is blessing the children. These weren't just little toddlers that he was blessing and hugging and laying in and blessing. Let me go back there. I know I'm kind of going all over the place. Jesus took the children up in his arms one by one. Each individual child. He didn't give them a group blessing. Each, this must have taken all day. <laughs> this probably took all day. And the disciples are going, hurry up. He took each individual child. Oh, in the, in the study I did, this wasn't simply toddlers. It was toddlers, yes, but all the children up to roughly the age of 12. So young people. All the young people. He took them up, and this is what the Scripture does say, He took them up in His arms. He didn't just lay His hands on them. He held them tight to Himself. A bear hug. One by one, and the Scripture says, fervently invoked a blessing upon them. Fervently. He was pretty loud about it. Heartfelt. Heartfelt invoked a blessing on each and every individual one of these children. I can see some of the people saying, Well, golly, he never blessed me like that. Well, he probably would have if you would have asked. You know, I thought about this this morning, too. I can, and if it is in the Bible, please share it with me. But I can't recall one instance of an adult approaching Jesus and just simply ask for a blessing. Hey, Yeshua, would you bless me? Could, would, all I want is for you to lay your hands on me and invoke a blessing. That's all I want. No, it seems like all the adults in the room wanted something from him. Wanted healing, wanted free food, wanted to have their questions answered. And the real evil ones were trying to test him and get him to trip up with his answers. But they all were clawing at him, wanting something from him. Something that would benefit them in a, either an intellectual capacity or a physical capacity. I can't recall one adult humbly asking Jesus just for a simple blessing. I can't find it. But the children did. Huh? Oh. Do you see the zeal that Jesus had in blessing these children? There aren't that many references to Jesus being indignant in the Scripture, but this is one of them. And it involves his little ones. And I've said it before, and I will say it again and again and again. If you are 
one of his or if you are an orphan and if you were abused by people posing as your parents you qualify you're one of his little ones you're one of his the theological term is elect. You're one of his kids. You're one of those kids that we just read about that he takes up in his arms like he doesn't want to let you go. And he's looking over at these, quote, adults trying to stop it. And yeah, I laugh. We laughed. I laugh when I said he probably wanted to spank him, but it's kind of rising up in me now. No, he wanted to hurt them. And trust me, he wants to hurt those who offend his little ones. He does. He's being restrained now. There's spiritual laws in motion that are holding, we'll call it wrath, the wrath and indignation of God at bay. He's trying to get as many into his kingdom as he can. He's holding back. But in his heart, he wants to unleash on these wicked people. He's on fire. But not so much you guys. No, he wants to set you on his lap and hug you and hug you and bless you. Yes. Hug your pain away. Hug the lies away. Like the tears. Yeah. Hug the lies away of all the shameful things that were instilled in you lies about him amen amen